were at a green meeting at the 1981 NFO convention in Indianapolis where Ray Jorgensen is about to begin the green meeting. The intention of these workshops is to more or less keep an informal session. This one is titled Ain't Just Another Grain Company and the background of selecting that title was that Ed and I had talked about it a month or so ago that there seemed to be a lot of confusion uh, at least in parts of the public's mind uh, about why we were different than another grain company or what made us unique from a regular grain company. So we thought we would distinguish some of those differences. How many of you were at our big sessions last year at National Convention for grain? Okay, we intend to keep these more informal. Um, at those sessions last year and the year before, you know, we extensively dealt with the traditional grain traders grain procurement system and what made that system function, why it functioned the way it did, uh, what happened when it paid too high prices, uh, what happened and how high prices jeopardized the functioning of that system. How many of you heard Frank Kraft's speech yesterday on the convention floor? Okay, again, Frank set the tone, the general outline of our approach for the past year and for the coming year in the grain department. And he outlined very extensively uh, some of the things that we are, we've been doing and that we've been working on. Room 106, right next door, is the VIP room. We'll talk more about the VIP here later in this session. Uh, that room is open all day today, all day tomorrow. Uh, any questions you may have on the VIP program, we'll handle in there. At room 107, just down the hall, uh, there's a bargaining meeting called more than you bargained for. The next bargaining meeting will be at 1 o'clock and there will be another one at 3 o'clock and those will both be in room 107. In this room at 1 p.m. there will be a special transportation workshop conducted by Ron Schrader and he's with a consulting transportation firm in Washington DC that we've hired. He will spend about 40 minutes concentrating on his analysis of deregulation by the railroads and the proposed users fees on the river system. He will also make that transportation presentation at 10 o'clock in room 107. So as far as the bargaining meetings go, the one, the one that's being held down there right now plus the one at one and the one at three will be the only three bargaining meetings we have. Those are conducted by Jack Lawson and Jack Ream. Um, the transportation meetings will be at 10 o'clock in room 107 and at 1 o'clock in this room. So if you know anybody that wanted to get in on this workshop, we'll have the one at th this hour at 10 o'clock and again at 3 o'clock this afternoon. Just to give you a little background on yourself. If you were at the meeting last year, you understand my Swedish background, so I don't need to go into that. I started as a grain rep in Montana in 1973, um, went off staff in 1974, and in 76 moved to Washington where I worked Washington, Oregon area, northern Idaho as area grain director. After we set up the regional divisions in the organization, I became assistant regional manager for the Northwest, and then when Frank Kraft was moved to the home office, I took his responsibility in the Great Falls office as regional manager, and then this past Labor Day moved to the Home Office with a responsibility for Director of Training and that job involved training grain reps that were already on staff plus new grain reps and hiring a replacement for myself so that I could devote attention to as Director of Operations in the Grain Department. I had been living in Portland, Oregon and was promoted then moved to Great Falls and then of course got promoted to Corning. I told Frank one more move and I'd really be in the woods. We're going to distinguish, and I'll just take a couple minutes here to get started, and then I'll turn the session over to Ed Tiverti, and I would like you to lock the door after, after you're in, please. Just bang it shut, yeah, and then lock it. That bottom one, I think, locks it. Factors, distinguishing factors between a 
grain company as such and the grain department of the National Farmers Organization is that the grain department of the National Farmers Organization is the only organization that has bargaining as its goal. Every other grain company, every other grain concern works from a merchandising point of view. In other words, given the markets out there, handling grain, no matter whether they're brokers, resellers, or handlers, on the basis of buying and selling, taking title. Um, one of the disadvantages, of course, of, for the merchandiser is that he cannot guarantee payment. He operates under a bonding system. And as you're aware, in some of the areas in the Midwest, sometimes that bonding system does not cover in case of that buyer or reseller or broker uh, defaulting or taking out any kind of bankruptcy proceeding. And the bargaining, uh, our, one of our goals, in addition to cost of production plus reasonable profit, is always to protect the grower's money and his product as it moves through our organization. Bargaining's goal of cost of production plus reasonable profit is unique. In that sense, you belong to the most unique farm organization in the nation. There's no other organization that has that uniqueness of goal. And that uniqueness of goal started really 25 years ago. And those of us who have been members less than 25 years owe a debt of gratitude to the charter members who started, in effect, a revolution. When 25 years ago, they made the statement that prices are set by those who have the power to set them. Farmers in, never in history had made that statement before. And that's why 25 years ago and 20 years ago and 15 years ago, that early opposition was so strong because they didn't want farmers making revolutionary statements that prices were set by those who have the power to set them. So we have to take our hats off to the charter members that got this bargaining organization started so that you and I today can, can be where we're at in continuing to fight for our right and pri in pricing our product at cost of production plus a reasonable profit. Ed is going to distinguish some of the differences, basis the handlers of grain at the county or regional or interior level and our bargaining efforts. Keep in mind that one of the earlier struggles 40 years ago was to set up a co-op structure nationwide. And that co-op structure was set up for two reasons only. One was to get the service that farmers needed. Prior, prior to the uh, co-op structure of grain handling being set up in the countryside, the grain companies themselves operated all the elevators in every county in this nation, whether it was the Cargills, the Kellogg's, the PV's, whoever it was. <coughs> and they operated those businesses on the basis of eight to five business as normal. In other words, it didn't matter if it was harvest, it didn't matter if it was seeding time, they stayed open as a regular business would. And one of the things that farmers needed, of course, was service from their local elevator that was based on a seasonal nature. The second reason the co-op structure was set up was so that the grain companies would be forced to lower their margins to a reasonable level. In the 1920s and early 1930s, the elevators at the county level, the private elevators, were ripping off such huge margins. I'm glad they can't get in. Were ripping off such huge margins that the co-op structure was set up to operate at a very slim margin. And if there was any profit, to return that profit to the members through dividends. Now, in those two goals, in establishing the co-op structure, they succeeded beyond their wildest dreams. There are places in the United States today where you cannot move grain unless it goes through a co-op handler. There are certain counties where the only thing you have is a co-op handling structure. In other words, the, the grain companies abandon altogether their elevators at the local or county or state level. And they allow the co-op structure to accumulate that grain for them. So the co-op structure, in effect, succeeded in its goals, but it's still different than what we are. And so I'll turn it over to Ed at this point to go through and distinguish what makes us unique in that sense? Thank you, Ray. Good morning, everybody. I'm. Uh, all, all of you have been at uh, concerts, I guess, and concerts when I say a country western show. 
And uh, this is like the Dolly Parton show, and he's Dolly Parton. I'm just going to fill in until you get to the main attraction here for a while. <laughs> Not sure I like that. I did hear, though, I saw a bumper sticker that if Dolly Parton was a farmer, she'd be flat busted, too. <laughs> Um, my name's Ed Tiverti. I'm from Nebraska. I, a lot of you, most, a lot of you, seen me around the convention. I've been uh, around for a while. I'm uh, working out of the home office with Frank Kraft. I was the uh, same thing as Ray was here, regional manager, and Ron Hilger has taken over that position. I farm about 90 miles west of Omaha. I got a couple of cohorts over here. Don't live too far from me, sitting in. So they'll go back and report on whatever we say. Ray said here that there's a, probably as last night, those of you that uh, heard Devon's speech, uh, we're going on with trying to get out the best kept secret that has ever been kept uh, and in these workshops. I think that we as NFO people really don't understand what we're trying to do. I think I hear, heard, hear the phrase more than anything else that we're going to sell the grain to NFO or we're going to sell it to you or some <laughs> such thing as that. And I think that the image is that NFO is another grain company or another broker or another reseller or something. And, and we need another one of those out there about as bad as we need a hole in the head. I can stand on my yard and I can see six elevators from my yard where I want to go. So I don't need any more elevators or systems such as that. And so I think that the the biggest problem that we have to image wise get is what we are bargaining versus merchandising and there's a very big distinction <coughs> first of all uh, you can merchandise with a load of corn no problem but to bargain you've got to have some volume and that's the whole story of it uh, merchandisers are we've got all kinds of them the brokers and the resellers the merchandiser takes grain from you that you put into him. This can be your local elevator. It can be a truck broker. It can be a lots of different things. But it, you tell him you've got a load of grain to sell, and he sells it. Just instead of you asking, what do you give me, he asks it for you. And he takes his commission out of it, and he moves it on, and the next man resells it and resells it and resells it. In bargaining, the ultimate is that we put the block of grain together and we bargain for it. And the bigger the block, the bigger, better bargaining power you've got. And the ultimate goal in bargaining is a cost of production plus a reasonable profit. We really haven't been bargaining in NFO very often up to this time. We've been merchandising within the system. And I think that a lot of people have a hard time understanding why, why should I put my production through NFO, National Farmers Organization, when I can do just as well or I can go to the elevator and do the same thing you're doing. Well, that's not quite right. The first thing that you and I in this revolution have to do is to establish that no longer can our production be bought from us as an individual. Our production has to be procured through our bargaining agent. No matter if it's at the local elevator and sold whatever it is, that's the first step that has to be taken that we cut this off, that this elevator no longer can call me John Blow and ask and get my grain. That's bargaining. And it's the first step. Even if you, as we say, can't get any more going through this organization. But the most important step is that first one, that we sever that tie, as that, that so-called individualism that we've been taught. And our bargaining agent, one agent nationwide, becomes our bargaining agent for that production. 
We don't no more go to the merchandiser. The system that was set up to procure that from us. It's a very distinct difference between bargaining and merchandising. Bargaining and handling is the same thing. Merchandisers and handlers are price takers. Whatever price is given, we take. We call up and it's really not a problem now. Uh, the tubes that we have set up here, or the screens, it's uh, been for the last three months, it's been money thrown away because uh, you don't need them. You can wake up every morning and, and uh, look at it when it opens up and it's been down, right? And we're taking it. What have we done about it? We go to the local elevator and we're price takers as individuals or as going through a broker. What can we do about it? As price takers in our local elevator, or wherever you might, local elevator to some of you people might be the terminal in local. So I'm not even talking in that respect of where you're at. Wherever you deliver it locally as an individual is what I'm ta talking about. And we take whatever price there is. We have no way of doing anything about enhancing the price. We walk in and say, what will you give me? Oh, we've, as we've progressed through the year, we've dressed this up. We say, what are you paying today? And what is the basis? And what did the markets do? But we're still asking, what will you give me for it? We haven't changed. We've just become more sophisticated. We've got to learn to use both sides of our brain. The farmer uses about half of it. The half that he uses for production is brilliant. To become the most efficient man on the face of the earth as far as production. But we've got a side that we haven't used. It's the price, pricing side. And we've either got to flip-flop it or put it together or do something to get to where we have to go. But if we continually stay where we're at, we continually stay as price takers. Through the National Farmers Organization, the program that has been laid out, we also become nationwide. We keep the farmer in mind. We are out to change marketing patterns. You know that every elevator in all over, no matter where it's at, have already been selling yours and my grain. They know basically when every farmer is going to market in his area. It's changed a little bit in the past year or so because of the uh, interest rates and your habits have changed a little bit. But they know when, by your history when you did it, when you have a farm payment, when you have a land payment, when you have a machinery payment, when you pay your taxes, when you pay your fertilizer bill, and they have sold grain out into the future on that. You don't believe me? Just try it. And go back to your own marketing habits and look how much you have changed in the past 10 years when you market your grain. We, we are price takers. Through National Farmers Organization, through the bargaining program, it gives you and I as a farmers an opportunity to be nationwide. It gives you and I an opportunity, whether we are a producer of 10,000 bushels of grain or 100,000 bushels of grain, to put it into one block and bargain for it. It gives us an opportunity to be, to be nationwide. And National Farmers Organization only has one thing in mind, and that's farmers. We have no other goal of showing a good profit or anything like that to stockholders. Our only goal is a cost of production plus a reasonable profit. And the only thing that we have in mind is for the betterment of agriculture. You, it gives you and I, as farmers, an opportunity to sell to the user, directly to the user. Over the past two years, it gave malding barley producers in this country to make sales 
directly to Mexico. The grain left the farmers, was put into the car and delivered directly to the user of that grain. We had, the first time around, we, we had some problems on it because it was first, it was a revolution. It was the first time this has been done. After the first sale was gotten off and gotten through and everything got settled, the brokers in that valley where it was came out of says, well, you did it once, but you ain't never going to do it again. We'll never let you do it again. We did it again, and it, it was, he was right. They did everything possible that it was within the system to try not to let us do it. And it caused us a lot of problem, but we did. The revolution kept going. And every time that it's done, and more people understand what bargaining is versus handling, and what bargaining is versus merchandising, it gets a little bit easier, and people start believing. And the biggest problem that you and I as farmers have is thinking that it can't be done. You know that if you left this room and went home and start saying every time somebody talks about it that you and your wife, that we've got a bad marriage, We've got a bad marriage. It's not going to work. I'll guarantee you within a year you'll be divorced. And that's exactly the system that is used on you and I as farmers when we talk about people that farmers getting together and get the job done. Everybody always says farmers will never do it, right? How many of you have heard that? Farmers will never get together. Well, we've got to change the image. They can. We do it in everything else. It, it, it always irked me that the guy across the fence always tried to rent the land from the neighbor to get bigger, and he'd do anything to try to get that land that was lawful and sometimes not even lawful. But if that man went out and had a car accident, he'd drop everything and go over there and farm the whole thing for him for a year. So we can do it. We just have to get the image changed on what we are. Power base. You know that we could enroll every farmer in the United States into National Farmers Organization and nothing would change. We're really not enrolling farmers into National Farmers Organization to get this job done. We're enrolling their production. And if we enroll the farmer and don't get the production, we haven't accomplished anything. We probably made some people mad because some of the stories that were told to him possibly, and he enrolled as a farmer, and then nothing happened because he didn't do anything, and he became delinquent on his dues, and it caused more problems for the people that came along that wanted to understand it than if we would have never enrolled him. Now, I, I realize I've been a member for quite a while in this organization, and we wouldn't be where we're at today without the people that enrolled because we didn't have programs at that time. So, you know, hindsight's always better than foresight. I'm just saying that it might have been. It probably couldn't have been that way, but we have to go from here. But now we're at a point in agriculture that we have proven every, most of the things that we started out. A lot of people say, well, nothing's happened in NFO. Think back 15 years when we talked collective bargaining, what people said. Yesterday, every speaker from wherever he's at endorsed collective bargaining from politicians to processors to anybody you talk to. We've sold collective bargaining. We don't have to sell that anymore. We have sold, we're not communistic anymore. I can remember when I was called that in the first time. We've proved we're not that anymore. We've proved that farmers had a problem. The American agriculture movement did NFO the biggest justice that has been done when they got farmers to admitting across the fence that they had a problem. Before that, you couldn't get anybody to admit that he had a problem. Well, we've, we've done all of those things. We've, we've proven that all of these things that we always hollered about are here now. So now we're at the point that we have to use all of those things and start building the power structure. Not 
farmers enroll the National Farmers Organization, and that's it. Collective bargaining is not easy. Our system is not like the old system. Collective bargaining and National Farmers Organization gives you and me an opportunity to do something for ourselves. It won't do anything for you. You've got to do it for yourself. Take the first step. No more be a member and say, I've paid my dues and that's it. That won't get the job done. Our power and our power base in this organization is our production. It just happens that farmers happen to have it and to get the job done, we've got to enroll the farmer and he has to enroll his production into the power base. Now what is this power base? It's not you and I enrolling and coming in here and say I'll try a load of corn with them and see how they'll do. That's not a power base. A power base is a block of production that keeps getting bigger and bigger and further out into the future so that we can bargain with it. And it doesn't mean 10%, 20%, it means 100% of your production. That's what a power base is. That's what National Farmers Organization, that's what the grain program, what Ray is going to cover, what it's all about. Our production, that's the only power we have. We have no other power. And if you try to compare price-wise today what you can sell against what NFO, I'll try NFO with a load and see what they can do and see what the old marketing system will do. You're not even given a fair test, let alone give us the opportunity and you the opportunity to enhance the price, to walk the price up, to become, as Devon said yesterday, contract farmers through the power base. That's what collective bargaining is all about. It's not easy. You have to do things for yourself. But the end is cost of production plus a reasonable profit. And the end is that you and I remain on the farm. I don't think, I'm going to close and turn this over to Ray. I don't think that if the good Lord gave you the talent to do something about this, I think morally it's your obligation to do something about it. And I think that we owe it to the next generation to leave this in a better shape than we found it. And we are not doing that. Do you realize that if our forefathers did what we do as the American farmer, we'd never be here because they'd have never left St. Joe, Missouri to strike out across the plains because they'd have lived as individuals and they'd have picked them off one at a time. That was, that was the start of collective bargaining. You know, they didn't leave alone. They left in wagon trains. They left collectively and they set this all up and my grandpa homesteaded out west of Omaha. He put up all the buildings that's on the place and the third or third generation, fourth generation on it is now. That same place, he not only can't put the buildings up on there, he's having a hell of a time keeping them painted, the ones that are there. I think that morally, we as farmers have really failed. And I think this convention and National Farmers Organization has never been more critical and, and needed more by the American farmer than it is right now. And we go out of here and we start building the power base in this convention and we go home and we spread the word. If we don't, we might not be here next year. I'm not preaching gloom and doom. And when I'm talking about you being here or agriculture or National Farmers Organization, they'll all be here. But whether you and I use this organization to get the job done is what I'm talking about, to finish the job. 
to build a power base so that you and I can compete in this great country on an equal with everyone else. I'm going to turn it over to Ray and for him to cover the trader system and the VIP program and such as that, Ray. Thanks, Ed. I'm not going to go into detail on the grain traders grain procurement system because we covered that extensively in our seminars for the last two years, but I do want to point out a shift in the traders system on the volumes of grain that leave the country for export. As you know, <clears throat> we went through an embargo well, I actually went through two in the last six years. And in spite of those embargoes, the export levels kept going up. And at the time of Carter's embargo, Berglund reminded us that it didn't matter. The export level of grain leaving this country would increase 12%. Anyway, and he was correct, it did. At that time, of course, we cautioned the growers that the grain trade was going to fill, one way or another, most of the contracts they had. And as the Soviet Union went around picking up grain in Argentina, Australia, and Canada, they couldn't quite fill their needs, and of course they had to buy some grain off the high seas. But when they went to these other countries to buy grain, our analysis was precise. We knew that as the Soviet Union bought grain from the grain trade anywhere else, that that was going to displace a customer in that country, and that customer is going to have to come to this country, and that's exactly what happened. We had people buying American grain that were not in our market before because they couldn't get grain in Argentina, Australia, or Canada where they had normally gotten it. So they ended up coming here. Remember we pointed out in the seminars that the grain traders are extremely efficient. We pointed out that they very seldom lose a ship, unlike their friends over at the petroleum industry that wreck ships all the time and, and pollute the seas. Even if you lose a ship, all you get is fat fish, you know. But we did. There was a 25,000 tonner uh, lost uh, just last week off the East Coast, uh, but that's very rare. The system that they set up for handling is very efficient, although Lee Needler up in Montana points out that there's nothing in the statistic for spillage. He knows, he says, I spill a little out there at the bin every, every year, and I spill a little at the truck, and I spill a little out at the elevator, and they spill a little at the railroad, but he says there's never any statistic in the, in the total world picture for spillage. And he thinks there's a lot of spillage, so we don't know. Anyway, there's, there's plenty to go around. One of the things that's interesting about the change in the patterns is that the, even though the Gulf remains the primary export position for American grain, for example, 59% of the corn that leaves the country goes out of the Gulf. And that's been a pretty constant figure, although the West Coast now exports 15% of the nation's corn. But we don't raise it out there. But 15% of this nation's corn that leaves the country goes out the west coast. And those are those grain trains that you see going to Seattle, Tacoma. 15% of the corn leaves the country by going off the east coast, and about 9% goes out of the lakes, Great Lakes. The change here has been that less of the corn now goes out through the Great Lakes and more of it goes out through the west coast, <clears throat> primarily because the west coast is year-round. And the lakes, of course, freeze up. Only about 2% of our corn goes out over the Canadian or Mexican border. Of our wheat, 49% goes out through the Gulf ports. In spite of the fact that we've had a couple terminals down there blow up, that figure remains about the same. In other words, they're just working extra shifts and repairing what they've got. 35% of our wheat goes out the West Coast and 10% goes out the Great Lakes. Again, that's a significant change in the past 15 years. The traders previously were exporting most of the wheat out the Gulf and then the next most out the Great Lakes, but the West Coast now has, is handling 35% of the wheat exports. The big reason for that is that more and more of our business is in Asia, and so it practically makes sense to ship grain by rail to the West Coast and then have it <coughs> shipped from there. 79% of your beans go out through the Gulf and 11% on the East Coast. On the West Coast, we only ship out about 1% of the beans. Just uh, reminders, I think, of the efficiency of the grain trader system. The grain traders, if they weren't reminded of it earlier, learned the lesson again last year with the Durham farmers that high grain prices stops the flow of production. When we first met with the Durham growers about two years ago, Almost every one of them said in Montana and North Dakota that if they could net $5 for their Durham, 
they would ship every bushel they had. And, th and that was the time when other wheat growers were $4 was the magic figure. But for Durham, there's a little extra risk. Well, what happened was the Durham went all the way to $8 and a quarter. But after it passed $7.50, farmers would not sell Durham. In other words, high prices jeopardized the grain trader system because there were not enough growers willing to contract on a profit basis. And keep in mind that one of those laws we talked about is if, if you don't contract at fair profit levels, it's going to be taken away from you by repressive means. There are eight distinguishing marks that I just want to mention briefly uh, to kind of summarize what Ed was saying about the difference between ourselves and any other grain company. The first is that we never take title, as he mentioned. The minute you take title to a farmer's production, you start thinking in terms of your organization having the primary responsibility for itself and not for the farmer. So we don't take title. Number two, we do not place any futures positions for our members' grain. In other words, we do not speculate or hedge or position your production on the board. Those of you that are studying the futures market very extensively now understand that what you have involved in the boards of trade is a computer Star Wars. And that if you're a really big farmer, you buy a $350,000 computer and pay $2,000 a month for the privilege of playing the futures market with your computer. In other words, a computer gives you the signs on what to do. It's become a, a very technological sort of a war. Number three, as Ed mentioned, we work with volume. Nothing more embarrassing for our bargainer than to go into the marketplace with a jag of grain. In fact, we have grain companies now that will simply refuse to write a contract, especially if it's less than a, a thousand bushels or less. They just, they don't want to mess with the paperwork and you can't blame them. Number four, as Ed mentioned, we work with a power base and that's long range acres. One of the officials from the grain company, as they studied our grain contract, said that that was the wave of the future. And Frank Kraft says, what do you mean by that? They said, because the day is coming, the American farmer either signs your R6 grain contract, your acre contract, or they're going to sign our contract. And for those of you, I remember Bob Fulf showed me a malt barley contract up in the Northwest one time. Beautiful contract, except it had big holes in it. And the danger, too, there was two elements of danger in a grain company's acre contract. One was that you had to sell it to that company. You didn't have any choice. And the third was that you had to have sold it by a certain date. If you didn't have a price, I think it was December 1, right? If you didn't have it priced out to them by December 1, they seized it on that day's market. So in other words, there was no flexibility in the grain company's acre contract. But the grain companies are pushing for acre contracts, and you're going to see them within a year pushing for multi-year signups from the farmers, and they're going to tie it in with their ability to help finance you. Now, folks, once a grain company finances you and signs up your acres, you're hooked, correct? Okay, we, we sign the acres, but we still have the option and the ability to go to any variety of buyers. Number five, we credit check our buyers and consistently review that credit check position. I remember in the Northwest when a lot of growers in the Moses Lake area kept harassing us to sell grain to Western farmers, a regional co-op out there, because their bid was 8 to 12 cents over the, anybody else's. And our credit department told our bargainer, if you sell them a bushel, we'll fire you. Well, we found out a year ago why, why our credit department said that is that, that company went under. And there's no Iowa trust to pay those people off that had grain in that system. So we must always have a credit check or credit guarantee with any buyers we work with. And you've been reading some of the stories here in the Midwest, some of them pretty fantastic. Six, nationwide bargaining coordination. We have to be the first to admit that in the past, our bargaining coordination has not as always been as excellent as we want it to be. And that's why I hope you get a chance to attend the bargaining section, one of the sessions this afternoon, because Jack Lawson has that responsibility to make sure that our left hand and our right hand in bargaining know what we're doing. In addition to doing that kind of analysis, Jack is seeking other researchers to work for us at the home office level. How many of you have still have old crop corn left? Okay. I remember I was in Michigan for state convention and there was a lot of it left up there. And I asked why there was any old crop corn left and we got some nervous laughter through the room. Asked why there was any old crop beans, and we got some more nervous laughter. 
Fact of the matter is that our bargaining division on July 13th urged every corn farmer to dump every bushel of corn he had. And very few did because the price was going to what? Go up. And had corn gone to $4, then of course the coffee shop talk would have been four and a quarter, right? So our analysis of wheat last fall was correct. We urged the growers to let us bargain out 80% of their production prior to December 1st a year ago. That analysis was precise and correct, and that's the kind of analysis we intend to take all along. Lawson will tell you, for example, in the bargaining session, if you've got oats, soybeans, and corn on hand now to put the corn in reserve or under loan and take your beans and your oats to market. And he'll tell you precisely why he makes that recommendation. So our nationwide bargaining, as it's got volumes to work with, can, in effect, do a good job. But it can't do a good job if we've got a truckload out of three counties in three corners of a state. That simply makes sense. Number seven, a distinguishing mark for the National Farmers Organization grain program, as opposed to, let's say, a pooling program, is that it's flexible and you, the member, maintain control. Because you make the key decision, which is, when you deliver the grain. In a pooling arrangement, you lose control of your production, at least in some of the pooling arrangements. In addition, of course, the, none of the pools are nationwide. A pool manager takes total and complete control. You get a, a, a what's called an average pool check at the end. In our program marketing approach, you maintain the flow of that production. Now, why do farmers sell grain? Now, I take my father as an example. He loves the farm. He's retired now. My two brothers have got the farm. But once he had the grain in the bin, that's when the gut ache started. He actually didn't even want to get the stuff. right? I mean, he liked to grow it, but once he had it, that's when the headache set in. And our market, here's how sharp we were in our marketing. Every December, he watched the market. This was before we got involved in National Farm. Every December, he watched the market. See, he didn't have to sell at harvest time because we were better cash flow than the neighbors. And the reason we were in better cash flow was we always turned out all the lights and we saved money that way, you see. <laughs> of course, we could have left every light burning on the farm for 30 years and it wouldn't change the P&L statement, but we saved money by turning out lights and doing all those things, hiring winos to work for us. So in December, he watched the market, and then we delivered in January. And in Montana in January, it's 42 below. So when it was 42 below, we were hauling wheat, and you had to put the blowtorch on the auger engine to keep it running, and you had to plug the truck in every night with the tank heater. And then because we were shrewder than our neighbors, we never sold any barley until just before we harvested new crop barley because the feedlots liked that old barley. New barley's too hot for the cattle, see? So our barley had been through the sweat. So when it was 142 above in the grain bin, in July, we were hauling barley. And that was our marketing pattern. The price didn't matter. We decided when we were going to get rid of the stuff. And the fact of the matter is that we all have marketed grain only for two reasons, either storage needs or cash flow needs. Price has always been immaterial. There are people now taking $6 beans to town that wouldn't sell $8 beans just a while back, right? But you finally go up against the wire, you need some cash. And I remember saying to a banker out in American Falls, where I asked him, I said, I suppose you got a lot of farmers coming here the night before the notes do and say they got to sell some grain. He said, I wish they'd come in that soon. <laughs> Waiting till after the cash flow need and then going down to one handler or another handler or another handler and trying to get them to, to come up a penny or two. Well, that's not bargaining. That's, of course, going out and, and begging. Well, in program marketing, you don't have to worry about that. You establish your <coughs> cash flow requirements based on your needs, not our needs, and then you go ahead and deliver what the bargainer has bargained out for you. And be sure and give that bargainer plenty of time. Put yourself in the buyer's shoes. You're a buyer today, and I'm the bargainer, and I offer you grain for December delivery. The first thing that buyer knows is that he's got some dis you've got distressed grain here. However, if you offer that same buyer May delivery grain, he knows that you don't have to sell it to him. So the more time you give the bargainer, the more strength you give the bargainer. He, partner, has to sell the December grain here right quick if you've established you've got to move some grain in December. So the program is flexible for you. If we haven't sold your grain for you yet on the program, you have a right to put it back in the power base, put it back in Section 2, because maybe you had an oil well sprung up on the place or something. You don't need the cash now. 
I remember meeting a farmer in Sydney, Montana. I said, what do you think of grain prices? He always said, I haven't paid attention to them for a couple of years. I couldn't imagine that. I said, what do you mean? He says, well, since I started getting that $7,000 a month check from the oil well, he said, I really don't pay attention. I said, I suppose you just dump all your grain then. He says, no, I've stored it all. <laughs> He's the same guy, of course, that told me earlier on the plane that the reason he was a farmer is he wanted to feed a starving world. Pretty hard for the starving people, of course, to eat that grain out of his bin. So there, there are eight, at least eight things plus what Ed reviewed here that make us unique as an organization.